to the Weekly Bioanalysis, a KCAS podcast. Hello and welcome to the 66th episode of the Weekly Bioanalysis, the official podcast of KCAS, Bioanalytical and Biomarker Services. KCAS is a bioanalytical CRO serving the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industries for over 40 years. My name is John Perkins and I've been in the bioanalytical LCMS space for over 28 years. I'm here with my co-host, Dominic Guarino. Hello, my name is Dominic Guarino and I'm our Senior Director of Scientific Services. And I've been uh, in the LBA and uh, immunology and gene therapy space for the better part of 29 years. Dom and I are members of the growing scientific advisory team at KCS. Either or both of us are available to answer any questions you may have regarding this podcast or any of KCS's services. Today, we're here with a couple of special guests. Don Dufield, Senior Director, Biopharma LCMS at KCS. Hi, Don. Hello, how are you? <laughs> and, and Barry Jones, Associate Director, Biomarker Bioanalysis at Kinetics Pharmaceuticals in San Diego. Hi, Jan. Both Don and Barry have extensive bioanalytical LCMS experience to help drive our main discussion today. Barry and I are located in different parts of upstate New York. Uh, Dom and Don are in Kansas, and Jeremy, our producer, is in Missouri, so we're truly all over the map. We're thrilled to have you listening to the 66th episode of the podcast, which is now available virtually everywhere. Wherever you choose to find and play your podcast, you can now likely find the weekly bioanalysis. We welcome all of you, whether you are joining us for the first time or if you're a regular listener. Today's podcast will be a review of the latest news and resources, and then a focus on a topic of our choosing before discussing any feedback we've had from you. We're constantly looking for topics, and we'd be happy to discuss something that you want us to cover. So again, we're thrilled to have you here, and we are looking forward to a fun episode today. To kick us off for podcast number 66, Dominic is going to go over today's podcast topic a bit before we jump into the news and resources section. Dominic. Yeah, John, as you mentioned, we've got a couple of spe- special guests here to discuss uh, recent advances in hybrid LCMS. Um, so we'll go over the current state of the market, some development in technologies. Um, just in general, we'll have a nice discussion around future thoughts of hybrid mass spec and wherever this might take us. The sky's the limit, John. With that, why don't we just jump in with first subject? First item, I thought we'd start with something light. Um, and it's, it's, it's touching on the early days of COVID. There was a recent interview on Channel 4 in the UK where... Um, Lord Bethel, a former former Deputy Health Minister from 2021, revealed that during in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, where actually the virus was was I mean, we were still trying to get familiar with what was going on, the UK government briefly considered asking the public to exterminate every cat amid fears that the pets could spread the disease. This was based on one Siamese cat being diagnosed with COVID and um that's not at all an overreaction. And I just it's, I thought it was just interesting, like how would you honestly roll that out? And could you imagine the uproar oh. um, if if that actually and that, and Lord Bethel actually said, could you imagine the reaction if we'd actually stepped to do this? And um, obviously it didn't happen, um, but I just thought it was. Yeah, it's a, it is. It, I think um, you know we're not going to make light of COVID in any way, shape, or form. But to step back and think that these were some of the beliefs we had even to the point where john i remember like scrubbing my mail right or having to take everything i had on my persons anytime i went to the grocery store and left it in the garage but (laughs) it it falls into that type of bucket where um knowledge is power and we now know that oh yeah yeah it's it's it's, yeah 2020 really helps looking back on it yeah i mean but there was instances where there were they were colds that happened I mean, but they were in controlled environments. So Hong Kong um, mm-hmm. test, tested and euthanized around 2,000 hamsters after several tested positive for the virus. And Denmark had a huge cull of, of mink um, after there was a concern that that could go from, um, you know, minks to humans. And, and it actually, you know, it... it it brought on a you know a, a general election in, in 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 Denmark because you know people who supported the government that was controversial enough that they didn't want to be part of that that decision. So I mean, and that, like I say, it's always a learning process here. Um, that they, they I think the 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 amusing part of this was you know 
social media went into uproar as people like you, you're not touching my cat yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. um but yeah. yes it's it just I'm, I'm glad it never came to that obviously we we haven't really seen any you know any real issues with you know it coming back from animals to to people and there was a lot a number of cases obviously where zoo animals were were shown to have caught covid i remember some like tigers and things like that mm. I can't remember where um but yeah it's just you know as it as it, it, it's an indication of in the early days of something like this, just how, you know, the sort of decisions that are be or the sort of conversations that are being had behind closed doors. Yeah. And it was just that interesting insight. It's a good, it's a good one to start with. It, it, it is, rem- it does remind us that we're all in this together, animals and uh, humans, right? Like it's, uh, except, except and this my- is not new. It's historically been a, uh, uh, something that we want to continue to monitor. Like if we see an outbreak in an animal, we certainly don't want that to jump to us and, Vice versa, we don't want to make and, any any animals extinct due to our viruses. But it's a good story, John. It's one that uh, has a happy ending, anyway, right? Yeah, and I think I think we should give the final word to um, Ten Downing Street's cat, who is is you know it's a there's a Twitter parody account because there's Larry the cat at the Prime Minister's <laughs> residence, who and the Twitter parody account basically said it's hard not to take this personally. Yeah, John, you always bring such a global presence to our podcast here. <laughs> but that's great stuff. I didn't know uh, Ten Downing Street had its own feline. Maybe I. Oh did. yeah, yeah, it, 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 I think I did know this. Yes, sadly, <laughs> Larry, Larry has outlasted several prime ministers. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, and, and, and we'll continue to outlast them. Yes, yes. From, <laughs> but from, maybe we move on because this is more in my bailiwick. Yes, absolutely. So, do you want to go on? With, or, I mean, that we. Yeah, I'll, you can tee up for me. I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. So it's it's two. Two protein knockout helps T cell therapies hit harder. Um, so it's basically a new strategy to overcome T cell exhaustion to hopefully make T cell therapies more effective against solid tumors. And this was um, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, researchers of Carl June's group at University of Pennsylvania described how they knocked out the genes for two inflammatory regulator proteins in chimeric anti gen receptor T cells, CAR T's and T cell receptor T cells. Um, the strategy shows potential, um, but the, in, there was actually the issue that the the approach um, boosted the immune response so much that it was toxic to some mice. So there's there's is obviously a lot of room for fine tuning, um, but it, it's all but the, there's enough there to suggest that this could be a a long term path towards um, using T cells wow. against solid tumors. So I will throw it back to you. Yeah, this is great stuff. So T cell exhaustion is a is kind of a conceptually kind of tough to understand other than, you know, they just get tired and they, they die. Right. But uh, CAR T cells themselves can experience this as well. Um, the mechanism of how it happens is um, probably not as, def- not as well defined as some probably portray it to be. However, uh, what they've shown here is in these two key, uh, they're, they're, they're this Regnase one and Roquan one, right? Those are the two, uh, I believe they're knocking out. And I, I want to give a big shout out to Carl June's lab who, that that's uh, probably if I if I had a bucket list of people I'd like to interview he'd be number one. Uh, he's he's somebody who's done more in, for immunotherapies than probably anyone on the planet, and here he is still continuing to do it, taking CAR T cells and CRISPRs, right, John? So they're, yep, sure. they're combining both of them. It's uh, I'm pretty sure it's still in mice, but this this is the next wave. So uh, CAR T cells have been highly effective, highly efficient. But one of the fears is that they can get exhausted, and, and through that exhaustion, the therapy may not be as potent. It could um, maybe wane and, and not completely remedy the, the tumor. And then, of course, solid tumors themselves have um, you know much different uh, challenges to them than, say, leukemia, lymphomas, and other tumors, right? Yeah, so I mean, there's, all there's, of that. there's been a lot of, you know, we've we talked about this in the past. There's a lot of discussion about the microenvironment and the solid yeah. tumors being yeah. much more aggressive towards CAR T's and things like that, which also plays into things which is, you know, renders yeah. them. In you read my, see, you, you know more about immunology than you portray, John, because you <laughs> talked about the tumor. You, I, st- I, you I, stole I, my thunder. I was about ready to go into the tumor microenvironment, and I was tripping <laughs> my scythe down to angstrom level, and I was in there fighting with the TNF alpha trend and not, no, but you're right. The, the, the solid tumors, because of, they have decoy proteins, they secrete things to like recruit T cells in and then kill them. Right. They do all sorts of uh, nasty stuff to prevent your immune system from winning. Hence the therapeutic is to go in there and fight harder 
And now we're finding ways to kind of make sure that they can sustain themselves in those environment and they, they don't get exhausted. I think it's like doing pushups and jumping jacks for them to get them in better shape. That's what this is doing. So it's, it's wonderful stuff. It might be another 10 years before it's in a human or five years or something, but this is it, John, this is the next wave of immunotherapies and so excited to, to see where this goes, but it's, this has been, um, we, this has been talked about for a few years now, and now it's coming to fruition. And hats off to Carl June and the University of uh, Pennsylvania Medical School. Fabulous place. Yeah. So, so just to build on what you were saying, they show they 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 focused on two proteins, Regnase one and Roquin one, that previous studies already showed that inhibiting those could improve T cell responses against cancer. So there was a, you know, they, they, again, it's building on what's gone previously, and say, like you say, going for the next step. Yeah, and, I'm, and I'm say, not familiar yeah. with those proteins, John. I, I'm something I'm going to dig in more to those. They weren't around in 2000 when I was studying my immunology degree, if you know what I mean. But those are new to me. But I do see they're in the um, NY uh, ESO one, which is like a, a the melanoma antigen. So. I'm pretty sure they're there or a testis uh, antigen, excuse me, and uh, one that's uh, been studied for decades. So it has major applications here. It, mm-hmm. it, sure. it can, the sky's the limit for this to- sort of technology. Okay. Yeah. So if you've got well, nothing this, more this to next add. one's a doozy too, John. <laughs> I was I was sitting yesterday thinking yeah, there's not much to talk about, and then once I just got into it, yes, there's quite a bit to talk about. So this uh, this is implications across the across the industry, but ultimately the, the, the first main ret article on this was in the Washington Post, and it was how a Com- Cambodian monkey smuggling ring could worsen U.S. lab shortages. And this is something we've been dealing with all the way through COVID. Um, you know, when, we're talked, when we talk to customers about projects, um, particularly if there's, there's uh, non-human primates involved, the monkey shortage really impacts our ability to get, you know, plasma to, to develop assays, etc. And it, it, has a, it has a knock-on effect on even running the study in the in the animal labs um part of that was because china was the biggest supplier of monkeys but with with covid they shut down um their supply of monkeys to the worldwide market so cambodia took over as as the main source for um is it long-tailed macaques and crab eating macaques um and um this this part part of the problem here is um there was actually a ring between um <laughs> Cambodian government officials and straight out of Goodfellas, John. <laughs> Again, sorry. sorry, straight out of the, like it's like a Goodfellas movie, like the oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> where there's where there's an opportunity to make money, someone's going to do it dishonestly. Yeah, I, I love the movie. If you, <laughs> and, if you haven't seen Goodfellas, go see it. But this is a lot like it feels like that. Yes, and so this actually dates back to late 2022, and I wasn't aware of it then. But two ga- Cambodian government officials and employees of I, I I picked this up from another article. Employees of Vani Bio Research, based out of Hang, Hong Kong, were indicted on charges of allegedly capturing wild long-tailed macaques, which are endangered, from national parks and protected areas, and falsifying permits amid a shortage of monkeys at breeding facilities. Further, the indictment indicates that these facilities euthanized captive bred specimens that they didn't think they could export and transferred their identification tags to the well caught macaques and secured CITES export permits that falsely identified these wild caught macaques as captive breds. So this this investigation is ongoing, um, but shipment of primates have, have from Cambodia have been halted, um, but this has actually then impacted some of the some of the bigger labs that we deal yeah, with, such yeah. as Charles River and Inativ. Um, you know, they they actually breed and, and they sell on monkeys, and it's actually interesting the impact of all this in terms of the cost of monkeys now. A monkey that would cost twenty five hundred dollars in in um, twenty nineteen was up to twenty two thousand last year and thirty two thousand this. So it's a good business to be in if you can if you can breed and and you know obviously sell monkeys on to other research facilities. But it does it like like say it has then fed into a a shortage down the chain um, where you know. You got animal. It talks about a animal facility that actually prioritizes where their monkeys can be used for. It's, it starts with internal research. And I'm seeing if I can find the piece. I, I can't right now. Well, uh, but go ahead. I'll let you. Yeah, check. As, I, so I was just at the Society of Toxicology, right? It, it yep, absolutely. That, um, it, it wasn't a focus there, but uh, you know, 
Charles River and Odaf, they were there, right? They're selling those services and they're they're experiencing some trouble. But like any capitalistic mar market, John, there are other laboratories that we've discovered that will fill this void. So um, as you mentioned, uh, it, a 10 times increase in the cost of these types of animals. However, um, I, I, I don't know exactly the name of these labs, but I discovered two labs that said they had next to no lead times and they could get monkeys for you and and within a couple of weeks. So there is uh, someone's moving into the space, John, and uh, that that's the good news for us. Right? So, I, I, it's tragic. This is a tragic story, in my opinion. This so did, so did, did you ask him, hmm, that's interesting, are they wild or are yeah, they? No, I did. They're, um, they're coming from the Virgin Islands, John. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah they're not. They're, and, and so it's uh, this is a definite, um, you know, it, it's just something that uh, it, it's tragic in that we should never they shouldn't have been grabbing wild monkeys people somewhere in there someone turned a blind eye this oh yeah this absolutely that, that's, that's completely wrong and, I mean, and, that... and of course these companies are now uh we, we we have colleagues at these places and their stocks are pummeling and it's just it's really a terrible story in the end but the the silver lining is uh drug development right research should be able to carry on because mm -hmm. there's a, we're in a capital mar capital market and somebody's moving into that space but it was you know it's it's kind of funny and tragic all at the same time but this is just a it's it's just we i never dreamed we'd be talking about something like this john right like this just seems like hollywood movie type stuff right? I, I, there's, I, I there's probably a hollywood movie in here somewhere <laughs> i think i mean it's basically it's it's interesting the way this has been a constant throughout covid and coming off of covid that the monkey supply has been a problem and and like say where there's an opportunity there's some people are going to address that dishonestly uh, i mean a part of the issue here is for for um monkey facilities they they obviously want to get sufficient monkeys that they can meet the demand of of research groups etc but also they don't want to stock too many because that becomes a waste for them and and so you don't you don't want to have animals you know obviously um unused and destroyed unnecessarily so that there's a challenge there and and, and they, they, the bottom line is that most monk, most monkey studies won't be impacted but it, there is certainly in the interim there will be uh, some of these animal facilities will have to carefully consider the priority of who what the monkeys are are being used for um and, and some programs will possibly suffer but they're, they're just seen as lower priority by the by the suppliers but um yeah it, it, i mean it's one of those things we've been dealing with it for two years we'll get over it like you say there's obviously other other facilities coming on to the market and if they've got no lead time that's great for us yeah. the question is whether that no lead time translates into lower costs for us yeah. in terms of and, and there's a huge initiative to just reduce the overall number of animals mm -hmm. for non-clinical that was a big part oh sure of it. yeah it's a huge and, and it's not going to happen overnight but like uh using c difficile to do uh like a just a bacteria to do some of the modeling is some of what i uh encountered oh, really? there. yeah really cool stuff just and and it's not like it's going to happen overnight but just think if we could cut it by two-thirds right yeah that, I, that's an amazing amount of um uh uh um, reduction in the number of animals needed so there's and and also uh in general we've loosened some of the bioanalytical requirements in terms of using 100 percent matrix here so sure. yeah Field continues to find ways to overcome some of these challenges there's always going to be challenges but it, it, this article is very interesting they're saying we haven't quite felt the full effect of this just yet which i believe is somewhat true but maybe we'll move on john and but it was i think it's a one to, to be determined and one will continue to maybe and, monitor and report on periodically because and, and maybe it is what maybe it is one of those things that helps feed you know the move to to yeah. Uh, not like you say not using full matrix and taking a surrogate matrix approach and, oh. and looking at other models and we know that we talked about this like two or three podcasts ago that the, the fda is encouraging the use of different approaches but like you say it'll all take time to yeah it's, start, to, uh, it's to, heavy and, in the cardiac space is what i and, and in the allergen space that's where okay. a lot of the research is being done inhalants and other types of things that aren't really they're, they're not core but there were a couple looking at you know well, hey can i do less for a cell and gene therapy type of uh posters as well but it was sure. a, it was a pretty um fair amount of research being done on it and it was refreshing to see that you know some it's it's always nice to talk about an issue john and then i'll actually go out and, and feel and touch it like i was able to do so it's sure. really good and i think more will certainly continue to look towards cell lines and even these 
more specialized sort of bacteria to kind of assess the safety of a drug, but it's kind of cool stuff. Should we move on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, cool. next one. Targeted, targeted, I'll try and speak properly now. Targeted protein degradation boosts Alzheimer's cognition in models. Um, and this is basically, this bottom to mind is a protein degrading drug might offer a new treatment, I'd say approach for Alzheimer's disease, according to the results of a study parts published March 1st in ACS Central Science. And this is researchers from South Korea's Kyung-hee University of College of Pharmacy in collaboration with Biotech Praiser Therapeutics, um, looking at small molecules to target protein degradation um, and re really using that to break up um, a hard to tackle form of the enzyme P38 M MAPK. Um, use of the drug improved both cognition and reduced amyloid beta plaque building in the brains of Alzheimer's mouse oh. models. So there's been a lot of interest in these kind of drugs in the in the last few years, especially for cancer, um, because they they basically work by exploiting the intercellular intercellular ubiquitin protease system, which flags proteins for destruction by enzymes or proteasomes. Mm -hmm. um, there's a number of, of of drugs in 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 um, development uh, with Protax, Litax, and um, a company called C4 of a, a uh, molecule called or degronomids or the class of molecules mm. but basically the, the the aim is to to go undruggable diseases and then and the koreans group green group approach of this particularly the p38 mpk which is thought to trigger patholo pathological processes in alzheimer's it phosphorylates and their their hypothesis was that when people are, are tackling P thirty eight MAPK, they're going at the non phosphorylated form, but phosphorylation actually changes the shape of the of the protein, so it actually makes it um, undruggable for those 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 kind of molecules. So their approach was actually to go at the phosphorylated form and and, and look at and screen molecules to actually go after the phosphorylated form of the of the um, protein and attack it that way and that's where they saw success mm. yeah uh, it's uh 20 well 15 or 20 years of research that they're capitalizing on here i think john right so it's uh been a um kind of a, a i call it a shutout right i don't think there are any true alzheimer's or even parkinson's diseases that have been demonstrated to be highly effective and this nope. is uh kind of, none. yeah kind of taking a different approach right it's um uh, Yes. Well, it's uh, it's interesting. It's got some um, some obvious uh, efficacy in a, in an in vitro and and uh, modeling setting. But uh, hats off to him, John. I think well, sure. Tough subject. Yeah. It's the uh, challenges around uh, what what the field was looking at, like P A beta tau's thirty eight forty forty two, and then it was phosphorylated tau. And um, but when they what they are starting to realize is. <laughs> Um, they're they're so uh, complex that that became a huge big issue with trying to treat them, and then they've keyed it on this inhibitor, this MAPK um, inhibitor, and now they're realizing, oh gee, we need the phosphorylated version of it. So a lot of elbow grease and time to get to this point, but it looks to be uh, something that uh, could be very promising. And and good luck to them. And I'll, I'll take anything to help with that. I feel like every day I'm getting a little bit closer to that, but. Uh... <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe just it's, taking a cold shower and stimulating my mitochondria is the way to go, John. It's it's funny, you know. Every every day you get old, and you think, "Oh my God, I'm falling apart." But yeah. I have to say, it's the it's the mental declining uh, diseases are the ones that worry me the most. So um, yes, I'm, 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 I'm all behind these people. I want this to work, you know. But I, it is it's it's some really cool like. I'm always fascinated at how they tackle these things. They as scientists, right? How us as scientists kind of start to uh, try to collect the data bits and what is this telling you? And you you got to like play detective almost, and you start looking at things, and then somewhere in there you have an aha moment, and you try something. Else. And, and some of the we got two guests here; they could attest to this. It's just, hey, why don't we flip it, right? That's always yeah. <laughs> just flip it, and that's kind of what they did here. They flipped it. They said, well, why aren't we going after the total protein? Let's go for the phosphorylated version of yep, it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So they they've got it to mice. So they like you say they did the in vitro modeling. They've they've looked at mice, and um, it's uh, you know it's 
it's it's it's shown that there's potential there. Obviously, there's a long way to go before it would would affect us. But, yeah. yeah, and yeah, they yeah. mentioned the amyloid plaques and the tau tangles, which is still like, I think when they when the industry started to see all that, they were like, man, this is a like a Mount Everest of yeah, trying to figure yeah. that out. So, but they, but they, they tax. Yeah, again, it showed that this drug that with this approach reduced amyloid plaques and and some of the other signs that people associate with Alzheimer's. On yeah. that, I, I'll move on. Let you. Yeah. Yes, this is near and dear to us at KCAS. You bet. <laughs> sure. So, so let's let's move on to the the next. You you had something to say about the next one. I'll let you introduce it. No, you can you go you go ahead and introduce it. It's just this is all our alkaline hematin services for decades have supported this, John. So maybe you tear it up. It, it, actually, it isn't so much we supported organ on, but I, I, I want to, I want to. This is an int- it's an interesting one. I wanted to highlight this. It's basically Organon builds pipeline for women's health, but can't do it alone. Now, or- Organon um, are, are a well, there's Organon has a lot of history. It basically, yeah. they were a, a Dutch farm du- Dutch pharmaceutical company based in the Netherlands. I'm going to go into this a little bit more later. They were bought by Shearing Plough, and who were then bought by Merck, um, and so. The, the, their actual site in the Netherlands was in Os, so it's it's um, quite south of of Amsterdam, um, and Barry may know why I'm I'm coming to this. Um, but more recently, Merck spun out um, a group. They they spun out Organon to focus on women's health, and so this this the the, the actual headquarters are based in New Jersey, um, and the manufacturing place is, is, is site is still in the Netherlands. But so what they've tried to do is build up a pipeline addressing women's health conditions, and it, it's it's really interesting because as you read through the article, there's very little investment in biopharma R&D and female specific uh, conditions. And despite the fact that I mean we're all obviously we all have you know female relations who who deal with a lot of things that we as males don't deal with um i mean in 2020 only one percent of biopharma r&d investment was in female specific conditions excluding oncology but even with female specific cancers it only sat at four percent of total investment so for a company like this um i think it's i mean it's 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 great to see that there's a company going in this direction and focusing on it. And they've tried to build up a pipeline very quickly by in licensing both um, pharma compounds and actually um, devices that will help, um, help, you know, help fe- help female conditions, etc. cetera. Um, and, and a lot of, one of the points that's made by, um, I can't remember her first name. It's uh, sorry, Mill- just Milligan. I, I forget her first name. Yeah. I, for, uh, her name's Milligan. She's the head of R and D at Organon, and she makes the point that so much of the time when people are looking to address female conditions, they they just focus on hormone imbalance, and that's obviously what what's the root of everything. But it's really not, and so they're they're really trying to not only build a pipeline, build an understanding, and focus on different pathways. And one of the places this is where the alkaline hematin comes. Comes in and we've yeah. supported this for years, and I did want to touch on this. Um, they're looking at a lot of early early stage candidates, but they ha- they are looking at endometriosis and our alkaline hematin biomarker, which um, we supported a number of uh, big phase three clinical trials. And I'll, I'm going to pass it to you, Dom, because you probably know more about it, just because you've yeah. been here at KCS, and I'll let you talk more. Yeah. So endometriosis affects like they say one in 10, but I think it might even be higher than that. I mean, it's an unbelievable amount of females that suffer from just a heavy menstrual cycle. And uh, so we created the um, alkaline hematin test to previously, they used something called a a P blot. They used to visualize the uh, women's uh, sanitary um, uh, products. And now we, we went ahead and took a tube of blood and then extracted from the products and created a, an alkaline hematin level to kind of quantitate the blood loss levels. And so we were the, this is an FDA um, registered assay at the time. I, we've, we've kind of stopped the trials are over, but for a good decade, we supported thousands of these trials. And they even mentioned how hard it is to get women to enroll. So it's a double-edged sword there, John, with trying to, not only is there an imbalance with the amount of money invested Absolutely. in it, yep. it's just women in general. They, I think a vast majority of the women don't even know. They just think it's normal, right? That's that's part of the taboo around this. It's still unfortunate, but that 
endometriosis suffers of, I mean, like I said, I think it's a real, that's 10, maybe upwards of 20% of the women have this and they don't know it, right? I can't sure. imagine that. So anyhow, and, and not only the, this test allows for, um, there's an approved drug on the market for it now that does help women, but there's, as you mentioned, there's implants, there's a lot of like other um, uh, female specific diseases that can be potentially um, uh, treated just with uh, you know, these, they get a lot of fibroids, I guess, is what happens and knocking them out, they think. But anyhow, I'm by no means a, a, a woman's reproductive expert, but certainly near and dear to us at KCAS. And it was a, it was an incredible, and I think of it as an invention or however you want to think of it, but it, it was such a, um, not easy to, we, we were, have the abilities to look at a daily blood loss and a monthly blood loss. That's how sophisticated and we validated probably 30 or 40 different women's products and worked with over 25 or 26 different countries for this job. So it was, it was a massive undertaking in us. And really, um, you know, that, that was probably the backbone of what got us to where we are today. I'm, I'm going back a good uh, at least 10 years. Um, and when I joined KCS, and we had been doing it for a good five to seven prior to that. So for about I think it was close to 10 or 12 years we supported these types of trials. And of course we could easily bring it back on if we had to. I'll stop there, John, it's, but it's a it's dear and dear. And um, I believe I've even met, met, I think her name's Elizabeth Milligan. Milligan. It's, San, it's Sandra Milligan, I just I checked. Feel like I, I feel like I've met her, but um, anyhow. She's a head of R&D. And so, yeah, basically they, in, in terms of building up the pipeline, they looked at 400 potential pipeline candidates, and they have around yeah. eight. They're progressing with all the stuff, you know, num number of them in early, early development. But the the reason it's I, I, it's it's nice to see us pop pop in the news um, because basically I lived there for around. Mm. I'm trying to think a, a year, but we had a we in my previous existence we had a, a bioanalytical lab there for. Um, for for around about sixteen to eighteen months, um, the reason being that when Merck on the site decided that they were going to pull R and D um away from the site, and so they 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 closed down a number of activities, and we actually took on the 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 the, LC, the, the bioanalytical team in in Austin. It became part of of our company. So in terms of the integration, et cetera, I went over and lived there and, and, and led the group for a while. And, and so a bit of a soft spot for us. So it's nice to see it pop into the news and, and <laughs> see more about it. And nice to know. So the, the what happened with the Merck site in the end. Um, so when I first went over there, um, we knew that it was going to split into what they call Pivot Park, which is a research park. And then the Merck, yeah, they were still doing manufacturing. So again, it was more the, a lot of organons, um, previous um, uh, emphasis had been on female contraceptives, etc. Mm. So when I got there, you you mix with the Merck people. Um, you had to sign in at the front desk and go through it and you'd eat at, in the Merck canteen and it was, it was just like really nice way to do it. And then longer term, they split it into Pivot Park, which became the research group, and then Merck became its own facility. But of course, the people I worked with, some of those are still in Pivot Park, others went off to work for mm. other companies in the area. Um, but yeah, it's 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 it's, it's it's nice to see that that site. It, it, it unlike some sites where you know where a, a, a company announces it's it's pulling out or it's reducing its presence, then it eventually goes. This is one where actually Merck have, have done done what make is it made, gone with a really interesting direction, which could be really beneficial to to a large portion of the population. So yeah, that's why I wanted to. Yeah, you can hear the nostalgia in your voice, John. It's great. It's, it was it, it, it was a, it was. A, Professionally, it was a great time. Personally, I wouldn't say it was quite so good because I'm <laughs> family here. It just comes but out it now. Is... But John, we're gonna we're yeah. gonna move on to our main portion here. We've yes, got two, absolutely. We've got two great guests. Uh, we're gonna uh, talk about recent advancements in hybrid LCMS. And uh, without further ado, maybe we'll let uh, Don quickly say hello again. And those of you that are familiar with our podcast know who Don Dufield is. And then we can inter we can have Barry give a little bit of a lowdown. But uh, John, I don't know if you have anything other than that. We can nope. kind of have think, Ron say think, hello, and we'll wait. jump right in. We got a jam pack uh, topic to discuss. This is near and dear to us at KCAS. We've been uh, we we've, we've been doing it for five years. I'd like to think not like to think we are 
uh, le- pioneering some of this, I would say. Certainly, Don has her whole life. Yeah, I, I think for anyone doing LCMS, you know, when, when I started, it was all small molecule, and there was like the holy grail of doing large molecules by LCMS. Um, and se- certainly, it wasn't till the advent of the electrospray and iron spray interfaces that suddenly that multiple charging that you get on the on the molecules brought them into the realm of, or at least the mass range of of some of the, of mass spectrometers but it's still there was still constant focus on how do we assess and quantitate really large molecules because your multiple charging um for something like an antibody that is you know 150,000 molecular weight you're not really you're not really going to see in the range of a of a mass spectrometer so alternative approaches have to be looked at and that's where hybrid lcms comes into play i'm not going to say much more than that other than to say that we've got two experts in the field obviously we've don who's who's been with kcs for several years now and barry jones who i i've, I've known for years all all focus in that same area but it's a really exciting a really exciting part of of lcms and and I, I i genuinely think the sky's the limit for the technology but that's where what they're here to talk about so i'll pass it over to don now yeah and it, nice to be back guys it's been a while since i've been on uh one of the podcasts so it's nice to hear all the news and listen to your guys's uh conversation but yeah as john said i think um you know, we've been doing this for a long time and, and it's interesting because <clears throat> I always can kind of date myself back to um, when I started doing this, I was um, pregnant with my first child actually. So um, this was back like in 2000. And as John said, I think in the late nineties, it's when some of this became more, um, you know, relevant and, and possible. Um, but it really didn't take off, I would say, till a little bit later. But um, yeah, it's really nice to to kind of have this conversation. And, and again, I've known Barry for quite a long time as well. Um, so it's nice to have him, you know, join and, and us talk about this today. Maybe Barry, you want to kind of give a little bit of a um, background in your of your field in this in this area? Sure, sure. Thank, thanks, Don. And really happy to be here today and talk to you and 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 uh, Dominic and John. A little background on myself. Uh, I received my PhD in physical chemistry from Binghamton University. That's in in New York in 2007. Um, Before I I think before I even defended, I began working in the biology department there at the same university, running uh, QSTAR XL, the QTOF mass spec, uh, and a MALDI mass spec. That was mostly as proteomic support for the biology faculty researchers. Um, so that was uh, protein ID and peptide mass fingerprinting and, and some relative quant using isobaric tagging. So I was there for about two years. Then I joined Advion uh, Biosciences in Ithaca, New York, and met a certain John Perkins there. I quickly learned a lot about targeted quant with LCM SMS on triple quads because I hadn't, I hadn't been on those uh, prior to that. But I worked at Advion, which was then Quintiles and then Q Squared Solutions for 15 years. And ultimately, I was leading the uh, what we called the LCMS Biologics Group there, uh, where we commonly used hybrid uh, approaches, high-resolution mass spectrometry, uh, and multi-dimensional nanoscale chromatography for quantitative methods, of mostly peptide and, and protein biomarkers in biotherapeutics. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe I'll jump in here. I think um, it'd be interesting. I think a lot of us that started in this field way back when kind of came from the proteomics field, right? And that's kind of what I think I heard you say in the the beginning, right? So similarly, we were doing um, traditional, what's called quote unquote, traditional proteomics where, you know, we were doing 2D gels and cutting out spots and digesting them and finding um, a lot of interest, what's called interesting um, proteins or differences between disease or not disease. And what what we found at the time was we found a lot of things that um, might be different or changed. But when we were, uh, I was at that time working for a pharmaceutical company. And most of the time they said, well, that's interesting, but we really want to understand this mechanism. And so it was kind of like, it kind of pushed us into that whole targeted field, right? To kind of move towards people want to know 
their mechanism, their, you know, um, chemistry that's going on, their biochemistry that's going on, and they wanted a more focused approach, like, can you find this protein? And that's kind of how we evolved more into the targeted. Did you guys have a, a similar kind of evolution? Yeah, I, for me personally, I, I, I did. Yeah, working in the with proteomic applications, and then, you know, and then joining a um, a CRO, which was focused on um, LCMS. You know, it was uh, Jack Henyon's uh, lab. You know, focused on LCMS mostly for small molecules, but then wanting to to get into that larger molecule space, and then being able to bring some of those tools that were common to us in. Um, in the proteomic uh, uh, applications, bringing that into targeted quantitation, I think that it was a it, it was a nice trajectory for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah think I, th that... I think from my perspective, you know, as a mass, I I came at completely opposite angle where I came from. You know, my, uh, pure mass mass spec or LCMS. Um, it's always a case of how can we extend the application of this technology? How can we you know? Yeah, we can do small molecules, we can do peptides, but what's next? And and obviously, I, I was when I was started out, we couldn't even really interface routinely LC with mass spec, and that was a big deal. So it's always been that how can we take this further? That, that that's the driver for a lot of bioanalytical people. So that's yeah. why there's the nice marriage between the how can we take this further, and then people with the the proteomic background like you have to really, you know, again, that, that, that's, that's the goal there. Yeah. yeah. I think the interesting thing, John, is um, it's usually one of two approaches, but the way I approached it actually was um, my background was in protein chemistry and I got my PhD in protein chemistry and understanding oxidation and, and things that happen to proteins. And I wasn't traditionally trained as a mass spectrometrist, but I needed to solve a problem on sure. understanding what molecule and which amino acid was oxidized in a protein I was studying. And I used mass spec as a tool, right? Yep. So it was, um, it was kind of like, how can I solve my problem? And that led me into, into this field. So it was really good, um, lucky for me, timing, right? To get, to be able to get into this field. And then I, completely shifted and have been in this field for 20 yeah, years. Yeah, so, so I was part of groups that had the technology and was looking for a problem to solve. <laughs> that's the other way around, you know, that's that's where we came from. Anyway, so... Like, you got peanut butter, I got chocolate. Let's make a Reese's cup. <laughs> So yeah. shall we get on to the like? like let's me, go through yeah, some. Let yeah, let me just go give, ahead. yeah, let me just give my current employer a shout out because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm been very interested in biomarker quantitation and, and drug development. And so last year, uh, November last year, I joined uh, Crenetics Pharmaceuticals in, in John Wang's team. And uh, Crenetics is a, a pharmaceutical company that develops therapies for people with rare endocrine diseases. And so measurement of biomarkers in, in endocrinology, and, and endocrinologists call them hormones, uh, uh, is a rich space. It's a, it's a great place for mass spectrometry and the kind of techniques that we're, we're talking about here. So just wanted to... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Crenetics. Yeah. Yeah, please, please do. We're not trying to, not trying to, not trying to gloss over that at all. So yeah, it's, it. We're, we're in, I'm interested to know where, you know, where, where Kinetics is going in terms of this kind of work. So yeah, it, it's great to know. So j shall we go on to the agenda and maybe, maybe give a, uh, what, what's your take on where hybrid LCMS is at, at present? I mean, we, we've seen applications. Um, where where customers will come to us, but where do you see it stands in the market, um, and where what where can it go from here? Let's start there. Yeah, so maybe I'll start, and then um, Barry, you can kind of give your perspective. So, as I mentioned, we've been doing this, you know, since early two thousands, and and really, <clears throat> I would say around two thousand fourteen fifteen, it started. I feel to become a little bit more mainstream and. And people were doing it, um, at least more people were interested in understanding it and starting to um, look at, at doing it. And I would say, you know, in the last five years that I've been at KCAS, um, it's really, I think, been used very successfully, as, um, as John mentioned. And, and we can get into some of the specifics here in a bit. But I think um, part of that was really getting it out there to have people understand what it is and, and how can you use it. So I think um, for us, kind of the current state is 
Um, it, it can be used very um, routinely for um, places where LBA or traditional ELISAs um, were used in the past. It doesn't have to you be used for all of those. <clears throat> there are definitely some um, interesting, unique cases that it, I think makes more sense to use hybrid LCMS. And then there's several that you could use either. So I think um, it's it's becoming more mainstream for sure. And I think the the evolution of it in, in its popularity is really about getting people to understand what it can do and that it's it's not, you know, voodoo magic science or things that nobody can do. So it it's more um, becoming more mainstream from that perspective, but it really is going to be um, having people understand it and talk about it and see what it can do. And I think it'll take off. But what do you what's your opinion, Barry? Yeah, I, I think I agree. I don't. I'm not sure about the demand for the for the technique across all of the, you know, all of the CRO space. There was high demand when I was in it, but you know, we, I, you know, from the amount of, of of this that we've we've done over the years, certainly that had been increasing quite a bit. Um, but you know, my, my team was focused on those specific bioanalytical challenges, and I'm I'm not sure, you know, how many other. Uh, uh, Places are, are doing this and have, have done it as long as, as as yourself or say Q squared solutions. We we'd been at that for well well over ten years with you know doing both automated offline bead based IPs as as well as the online IP techniques that um, that you Don have, have shown us how to do, especially with your 2012 article and methods. Which yeah, anyone yeah. anyone listening it wants to do this should this should be required reading. <laughs> but I, yeah, so I don't have a feel for the current state of the market, uh, but but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I do. I did see an increase, at least in our in our lab. I, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna. I think it's interesting. Um, have you been to EBF, Barry? I noticed, yeah. you know, a few years ago, it seemed to be a lot more discussion of hybrid LCMS at uh, EBF. But in the last year or so, it, it's it's gone quite quiet. So I don't know. I, I don't know if there's a if there's a difference between the how the US is because we got thought leaders here driving it here. I don't know if it's sort of gone quiet in the in the in Europe because there's there's less you know people to really push um, taking that approach versus LBA. I, I I don't know what's behind it, but certainly you know with EBF being the main meeting of the year, there, there was really nothing on hybrid. I mean, we 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 went last year and we we presented uh, but you know the way ebf works they have a number of categories you have to you, you're you're trying to submit an article to to get into to present but there was nothing on hybrid at all the, the, and then it was like i don't know probably 20 different categories i think maybe a little bit different there may be an opening this year and dawn i need to talk to you about that but um it, i think there is it's i think it, you're right it needs to be talked about more to, to get people to to think oh Oh, I see that. That I, I've got a problem that that could help with, and I'm not sure it's it's maybe happening. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, now that you say that, I think, like I said, back in 2014, 15, I was doing a lot of quote unquote roadshowy, you know, short course things at various meetings, um, and I think it was maybe the new sexy thing, right? So everybody yep. wanted to understand it and see what it can do, and I think. Um, it, it kind of flared up there. Several people looked at it and started doing it. And I think where we are now is, like you said, it's not as um, mainstream at the conferences as a topic or because it's not as new. So I think mm-hmm. there's either a group of people that do it and know how to do it and use it. And then there's the people that still maybe haven't heard about it or don't use it so much because it's not being talked about. So it's, we're kind of in that two two world kind of um, situation. So maybe yeah, we really need to to get out and <clears throat> and you know using this podcast is is one avenue and webinars and talks and stuff to um, to really showcase the what it can do and and how good we're getting at it so that it's very competitive both from a cost and timing perspective. Um, now it's, you know, for, again, the people that know how to do it, you, you can do it very well and and efficiently. So, um, I think every time, like you said, when we've talked about it to a client or, you know, out in the public at a conference, people are 
oh, I didn't realize it could do that. And oh, yeah. oh well, that's really good. And oh, you know, and so we, it, it, we have to find a better way to do it than convincing people one by one and company by company. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how to push that, but I do think we, we need to push it a little more because I do think there's a, a lot of power in, in what it yeah. can do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That- so, yeah, Sorry, go on, buddy. Yeah, John, you, you mentioned EBF. I think you see it at, at WRIB as well, right? It used to be, I remember the small molecule was one day, the large molecule was the third day, and the middle was was hybrid. And it's, it's not structured that way anymore. But I, I agree. I think it's more commonplace and maybe less publication worthy as it becomes less novel, um, which you know is, is a good thing, right? If it's uh, if it's really starting to uh, to take off and become more. I think, I don't. I, I I still get the impression though. I think it's. I think it's. There's a comfortable group with it, but it's not really t- bridging out beyond that. And, and like I said, we're sitting here saying we can see the potential in this, but I'm not sure that it's. I don't think enough people have seen the potential in this. That's that's where I see the gap. Um, that's just my 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 personal perspective on that. Um, I I don't know. I, I, we have an agenda, but I don't know if we what we want to touch on here because we can can pretty much do it in whatever order you feel like. Is there? Um, I mean, what what what. Uh, let, I'll just go with this. What de- developments in technology have you seen exciting, and what would you like to see just to get the get the keep the discussion going? Yeah, so I guess you know a, a couple things. Um, I would say when it comes to technology advances, unfortunately, nothing's changed much in the last several years, right? There's um, like with respect to instrumentation, right? Mm-hmm. There. We still have triples. We have some high res we can talk about. Um, But I would say for this field, there's not been a huge advancement in technology that's enabled it. It's it's more like we've been talking about. It's more about awareness and knowledge. And, um, you know, that's how we kind of can do it. I do think, um, you know, there's a few things that that we've talked about on the side. And there is a little bit of... um, this discussion going on and I've talked to Barry a little bit about this as well is one of the um, problems we've seen for not completely the targeted, but there's been some, let's say extension of this technology to um, ADA anti-drug antibody type assays or NAB type assays where, or isotyping where we're trying to understand, you know, IgEs, IgMs, IgGs, that kind of thing. Um, and one of the problems we have is <clears throat> the bead technology that, that Barry mentioned um, has a lot of nonspecific binding. Sure. Yep. And, and I think that is an area that um, when you're doing targeted, you might not see it as much because you're only looking for what you're looking for. But when you start to do this more wider, you know, proteomic kind of analysis, um, it can become a problem. So we have recently started working with a couple of different companies and vendors to see if we can develop a better bead or a better platform, even, you know, plate-based surface or something um, to, to minimize some of that. Um, And I know Barry, I think you guys kind of encountered some of that as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I agree with with overall with your, assessment of the technological improvements that there's minor ones happening all the time with uh, beads, um, you know, liquid or bead handlers, chromatography, but I haven't seen any paradigm shifting improvements in technology recently. On that on that bead topic, uh, Don, I am interested in your take on something, um, the, the bead conjugation strategy, you know, um, should, you know, and not, not just specific to um, um, the, you know, the, the types of assays that, that you talked about with isotyping, things like that, but just in general, if, if we should be directly chemically conjugating the antibody to the beads, are we still good with the streptavid and biotin conjugation? And if, if so, should we be pre-conjugating prior to incubation uh, with the sample, or is the solution-based incubation, which we tend to, tend to do with the quick bead capture afterwards, sufficient? And and if, and if so, how concerned should we be with the presence of, of biotin in our sample, you know, perhaps from vitamin supplements and, and, and the like? Yeah, so I think it really, um, the answer to a lot of these is it depends, right? <laughs> so I think um, having several options is useful. I think our 
current default, it's interesting, our current default um, approach for protein IPs would be a streptavidin bead because we, it's easy, it's quick, we like that efficiency, but it does bring up <clears throat> questions like, yeah, when you buy a tenolate, uh, uh, an antibody or a protein or some type of capture reagent, does it bind the same, you know, are you affecting that binding, um, you know, kind of beyond where you were saying, kind of having some background and other problems, but does it, does it change those properties? Um, versus like a protein G. Um, again, protein G is where we see some of these nonspecific things. Um, and then can you, you know, pre-coat, like you said, and couple a specific antibody and even cross-link it, right, so that um, it sticks on there and doesn't come off and reduces your background. The interesting thing is when we do peptide IPs, our, our preferred approach is a column format using... Um, <clears throat> protein G column with with a cross linking on it to, to make the antibody stick on there kind of permanently and then we can reuse that column and I think that's the, the publication you were mentioning um, where we kind of explained how to do that <clears throat> again I think um, having the options is really what's important and this kind of goes to you know, people can say, oh, hybrid, I know how to do that. But getting into the details of what works best when is really um, a little bit of an art, right, to know. I mean, you can always go with the generic and it, it usually works maybe, you know, 70, 80 percent of the time. But it's those 30 percent of the time ones that, you know, you just have to screen them. Like we, when we have one that doesn't work great, then we'll try the others, right? We'll say, OK, let's try protein G, let's try streptavid and let's you know, do other kind of coupling and, um, you know, do a multi-step, you know, um, incubate the sample first with the antibody, incubate the, the bead first with the antibody and really look at <clears throat> what makes a difference. And sometimes one of those is very critical to getting a successful assay. Yeah. I, I, I want to go a little bit of a different route. Barry, I know that you previously had a lot of success with uh, micro and nano chromatography, particularly when you're looking at, you know, real sensitivity um, needs. But, you know, we've got the, 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 is it the ultimate system that you routinely use from Dionics is no longer on the market. Uh, my question is, A, do you, do you persistently see the need to go to those, you know, Low, narrower diameter realms, and then what's the backup plan to lack of pumps on the market? <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't have an answer to the backup plan, but it's something that I think all of us are, <laughs> are trying to, to to figure out a you know a, a stopgap and then a um, you know a, a permanent solution to. But you know, in, in general, on the need for for um, nano electro spray or, or you know, just miniaturized chromatography and ionization, maybe, you know, maybe micro spray, nano spray, capillary flow, you know, whatever flow regime you're talking about, but but lower than than our conventional flows. It, we often see the 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 need for that, and um, you know, with th therapeutics, but also also with biomarkers, and I, in now being being on the on the pharma side with uh, um, important peptide hormones that are that are low abundance you know you, you look at how they these are measured uh, in in the clinical labs it's all amino assays and these are fairly small molecules from an amino assay perspective um, but they are difficult to measure uh, by by mass spectrometry mm -hmm. um, you know because they're, they're, they're so so low abundance so you, you really need some some lower chromatographic flow regime in order to to do that um, and then, it, then it's just a matter of, of, you know, making sure that that's that's robust. You you combine that, you can you combine that with some sort of orthogonal separation, you know, maybe a, a anti uh, anti peptide uh, immuno affinity. But I, here I would a little, little um, uh, put a little bit of a, a, a something about my a talk I'll be giving at uh, WRIB. Um, the, the, in June, um, it, it focuses on uh, some work that uh, that's been done by Lian Shan at, at Q Squared Solutions, and and you know we talk about hybrid, we're talking about you know some an assay that's part LBA and part uh, um, mass spectrometry, and and I'm I'm curious to know you, you know to to talk about 
how often we're, we're leveraging the unique specificity of that antibody for the assay, rather than, than using it as a, as a means to reduce the complexity and, and enable the downstream digestion if it's a protein uh, and the LC and mass spec conditions. Um, what, what Leanne Shen's doing is, is measuring some of these low abundant protein, uh, peptide biomarkers, hormones, um, by using a, a, an offline solid phase extraction, uh, no digestion, and then uh, using an orthogonal separation by, by using size exclusion chromatography followed by trap and elute, um, a reverse phase, and then um, the nano, uh, nano ESI. So you get the sensitivity and you get the robustness from the orthogonal separation. So, so in that in those cases, that that net nano LC is, is certainly required in order to get the sensitivity that you need in order to measure those. Um, but it, it, you know, it's 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 the, it's that orthogonal separation. It's not using it's not using an antibody, so it's t it's t it's technically not a hybrid assay, right? So I'm just curious, if, you know, uh, um, Don, how often you you leverage that that unique select specificity of the of the capture antibody. Um, rather than using it as, as, a, as a purification strategy? <clears throat> so, yeah, I think it, there's a couple of things there, right? So, um, so one, I think, again, it goes back to what do you have, right? So at the beginning of a project, you try to understand what are you trying to do, what's your sensitivity, and what tools do you have to do it? <clears throat> one of the tools, the key tools, right, is, is reagents or antibodies or you know, receptors or something. Um, so our default, if those are potentially available, is to go that route because, quite frankly, it's it's easier, right? It's, it's quicker and less work yeah. to do an IP than sometimes SPE and SEC and XYZ and, you know, everything else, right? Um, so we like it because it works very, very well and it keeps things clean and it's simple in our workflows yeah. but when we don't have good reagents then yeah we can do more orthogonal um kind of approaches because at the end of the day what are you trying to do right you're trying to isolate the thing you want and get rid of the stuff you don't yeah, yeah. so however you can do that that would be useful um and, and we couple similarly, <clears throat> sometimes we do SPE and then we do antipeptide, right? So you can, you can couple your tools however you want that, that makes it work. Um, so we, we kind of look at the program, I guess, a little bit more holistically to find out what's available and, and possible and, you know, quick and easy and what we can do um, efficiently. And that's kind of how we approach it. Um, I want to kind of revisit the, the nano and micro um, you know, I'm kind of, I'm a, you know, split down the middle a little bit. I came from a shop that did nano almost exclusively for, you know, 15, 20 years. So I was, a you know, a traditional nano person. I had one of the first cap LCs from Waters. I had a cap LC from Micromass, you know, right before I had an old famous and ultimate before it was, you know, um, Dianex sold it. And so we have been doing that stuff for a very, very long time. More recently with, <clears throat> now this is one area I would say technology has helped us is um, the 7500s are extremely good in high flow and we're getting <clears throat> very good sensitivities. So in the past, I might see, let's say going from high flow to micro 8X to 10X, 15X difference um, by go, just, you know, changing the flow rate, I could get that much signal enhancement, mm -hmm. signal to noise enhancement. Um, and now when I do that, um, it's more like 3x. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, well, is it worth it, right? Is it worth all those extra things you have to do to get micro or nano? Now, nano, I think, still gives you a, a good 10 or 20x gain. Um, the problem with nano is there's still not a lot of good trapping cartridges or, or miniaturized columns and things, um, you know, to couple things. So you're kind of limited to a handful of yeah. um, vendors or whatever, which is okay, but it doesn't give you as much flexibility. And, and when you work, you know, for a CRO that today needs to do high flow and tomorrow needs to do micro and the next day needs to do nano, you know, that's a little bit, 
<clears throat> different situation because nano is a little bit more of, you know, the art form and you want to spray it all the time. Now I will say, you know, Orbeez and thermos, you know, have a nice interface where you don't have to vent and you can use easy spray. And I think that makes it um, a little more simpler. And I think you're more, you know, that was kind of an, uh, uh, an instrument you guys used quite a bit yeah. on the Thiax platform. You're still venting and, you know, doing some things that cause you not to want to do it. So I'm much more, I guess, less of a fan of, of this super, you know, low flow rate. But again, it is an option if, if you need it. So it's kind of one of those, if I don't need it, I don't, I don't go that route. Right. right. So it, what yeah. do you need to get, to get it done? Absolutely. It, 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 if you don't need it, definitely don't use it. I think there's a lot of there's been a lot of advancements to, to improve the robustness and the usability, um, but it's still not as easy as, as uh, you know the, the more conventional tools. Yeah. yeah. So talk. I mean, so okay. So from now we have got a, like a little bit of a split. Do we want to talk about high, what high res can buy us, or do you want to talk about some of the successes you've had in terms of tackling some of these large molecular weight? Entities. I mean, you, you mentioned, um, you know, different trapping, not trapping, but different different antibodies, etc. Do you want to talk about ADCs and MABs, or, or do we want to? So why don't we do the the high res and the technology because yeah, I think fine. we're kind yep. of in that realm, and then yep. we can maybe move on to the applications. Sure. Um, yep. Works for me. Yeah. Yeah. So for high res, you know. It's always an interesting topic, and and I know I think Barry, you you can um, maybe even have you start with the high res because yeah. I know you've done it more routinely for um, targeted quant, I think, than maybe some other groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed, we did a lot of HRMS in my in my lab at uh, Q squared. Um, you know, it, and it's a good question. Why, why high resolution mass spectrometry? Why not a, a triple quad? What's the problem with it? Right? It's certainly the gold standard. Um, and, and of course, there's the intact protein quant question, which I should be clear about. I'm not. That's not what I'm talking about when I talk about the application of high resolution mass spectrometry to, to bioanalysis. I I have not done much of the intact uh, mass quant. Um, so small molecules, peptides, and um, bottom up proteins. So also peptides. So, you know, you know, it is kind of interesting that a lot of the work I read is the researchers will do the biomarker discovery work or say the, the upfront um, therapeutic uh, characterization using nano LC and high resolution mass spec on an orbit trap um, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, maybe establish the markers they want to follow and then and then switch to a conventional flow, a triple quad platform for, for quantitation. Um, and maybe lament the lack of sensitivity. So, but this topic is HRMS. HRMS is quantitative, uh, and it and it can be and it is robust. So, um, you know, we've seen plenty of presentations and publications where high resolution mass spec is helpful. There's some examples of disulfide rich cyclic peptides resistant to fragmentation. So you use the uh, the resolving power and 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 not fragment with a high res instrument. Um, there's overcoming triple quad selectivity issues. Small molecule yeah, examples. Yeah. Um, we've shown that for both the preclinical example and for absolute bioavailability with a cold microtracer assay. There's lots of examples that we can we can go into. But how often does that happen in practice? Right. For every every time we mm -hmm. see a, a, a HRMS solving a problem from the podium or from in the literature, uh, there's how many uh, you know examples where it's it's not it's not needed. Right. So, that, so I think that's the real question. So maybe you buy an HRMS system or, or two for redundancy and then relegate that to, to special circumstances and, and rarely use it. Um, but we use them for, again, for many, many things. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, so um, yeah, we're, we're, we're in that analysis right now at KCAS, right? So we have a couple high res instruments and in, in, in my previous life, right? I, kind of where is where I landed was where you just said I, we had a you know 56 60 600 back then triple top we had some orby traps um and generally you know we were a targeted mass spec biomarker protein you know pk kind of shop and I would say you know 99 percent of the time we're using the, the triples and you know maybe five or I guess it doesn't add up but you know not very much we would use the the QTOFs or the QEs um, to 
like you said, do the front end, kind of do some characterization, understand something, and then convert it to to a triple method. And I think the reason for that is a couple fold. One is, um, you know, the, the triples are cheaper generally, so you can get more of those for the same cost of a, a high res. Um, the high res are, are uh, fancier, like, you know, yeah, a top you'd have to calibrate you know, every couple hours or every couple runs, whereas, you know, triples you calibrate once every three months, you know, so the maintenance is less or the um, things you have to do on a daily basis. So what we're struggling with right now is it, as a quantitative shop, what's the best high res instrument? I definitely think there's a need for it. And in, in, like you said, those cases where you have a, you know, a nominal mass interferent, and obviously if you used high mass, you wouldn't even, that wouldn't be a problem, wouldn't interfere. Um, but how often do you have that problem, right? Yeah. Um, what, what, what we're trying to do and make the case, and I'm interested to see, you know, what's your perspective on this, because you've probably done it more, is, you know, can we use the QTOF or the QE or the Orbi or whatever, as um, as a proper targeted peptide quant machine, and if so, what kind of sensitivity do we see? So again, we're a mostly SIAC shop, so we have a 6500, we have a 7500, and then we have a QTOF 7600. So does the QTOF in a MRM-like PRM, you know, MRMHR kind of experiment, give me sensitivity somewhere between a 65 and a 75. And if so, then I can use it, you know, the 75, 85, 95% of the time doing targeted quant. And then the other times that I need to use it for intact protein or DAR calculations or, you know, anything else, then I can use it for that. So what's your perspective yeah. on, on, on kind of that approach? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I should, I should note that my experience is with the Orbitrap based um, yeah. mass analyzers, right? I, I haven't yeah. used a QTOF in many years, so I so I can only speak from that perspective. And on the cost uh, uh, perspective, I think I think that's starting to normalize. You know, with uh, between the um, you know the high end triples and the and, and the, the the typical Orbitrap based mass analyzer uh, instruments, um, I think that's starting to you know. That's not it's not such a, a huge disparity in terms of cost. Um, the and then the, you know you, you mentioned the stability of the mass axis for a TOF. Yes, it, I understand the, uh, the the need to to calibrate often. In our experience, um, the mass axis is very stable for for the orbit traps. Um, and and so I guess it, it and then then you asked about sensitivity. Um, I haven't compared. You know, head to head necessarily with a with a seventy five hundred. Sixty five hundred is a very sensitive instrument, but I, I would say that um, you know they're comparable in sensitivity. We've 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 shown shown sometimes, especially especially when we're limited by a high SRM background noise, that the uh, the high res system can actually be more sensitive. So it's it, you know it's it depends on the particular situation which is more sensitive. But I I do think you know that the the typical run of the mill every every day bioanalytical uh, projects that we have can 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 work just fine on a high resolution mass spectrometer maybe it's not a an advantage but it's not a detriment either right so you've got you've got a, an instrument that can do everything a, a triple quad do can do but can also um, tackle some some specific problems as well yeah so. yeah i agree yeah Okay, so and so, th thanks for that. So, the, so where have you seen successes in terms of um, the kind of projects that you've dealt with? I'll, I'll throw that out there, and I'll let either of you jump in on that. You're talking just in general, right? Just now. in general, or I mean, yeah, in general, I mean, what what where are problems that you've come up against that you had to take a slightly different approach to to maybe get round and yeah, did just yeah. So I, I guess I can start, and then we can get into some of the the more recent specific examples. But um, you know, generally, we we've given a couple webinars and and things right on how do you pick between let's say high res and LB or sorry high res hybrid and um, LBA. 
And I think, you know, like we said kind of earlier, a lot of times that choice is dependent on um, reagent availability, right? If you have, you know, a good pair of antibodies, you can go LBA. If you don't, you're kind of more limited. Um, you know, we, we've argued for many years, you know, you only need one somewhat decent capture reagent, let's call it, doesn't have to be an antibody for, for the hybrid approach to work. So, so that's always been where um, hybrid, you know, pops up more quickly. I think the other two areas that, um, that hybrid, I think, really shines is when you're, um, you know, trying to differentiate between something very closely related. So maybe it's one, two, three amino acid differences, you know, maybe the binding site doesn't change and you're antibody doesn't differentiate that, but obviously the mass spec can see those as very discrete masses and, and that makes it an obvious um, option. The other places we've seen it um, pop up a little bit more is when we start, let's say, down an LBA path, things are maybe looking okay, and then you run into like drug tolerance issues. It seems like um, the mass spec approach is a little bit less um, problematic when it comes to drug tolerance. Um, and I guess, you know, one of the things that, that maybe I can jump in here and um, one of the areas that, that when I was at Pfizer, we talked about a lot and I see it popping up a little bit more recently, routinely, is um, kind of the, the bound total free kind of argument, right? So what are you measuring and what can you do? And, um, you know, is it total? Is it free? Is it bound? What's the most important to measure, you know, from a PKPD standpoint? And I think <clears throat> having these options, so for example, let's say you wanted to get total and your IP reagent doesn't capture everything when it's blocked or when it's bound. You know, one of the, the nice approaches with the anti-peptide approach is you can digest the whole sample up front and it cuts it all into pieces, whether it's bound or not. And then you can fish it out on the back end with an anti-peptide and, and get the specificity. And so therefore you're avoiding the whole problem of the initial binding. So I think again, in, 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 there's a lot of unique cases where the only approach might be hybrid. And then there's a lot of cases where you could use either approach. Mm -hmm. um, sure. So I don't know, Barry, have you guys done much of with, um, bound or free or total or any of those kind of approaches? Yeah, we have, we have done, done some of that. And, you know, I asked you before, what, uh, um, when do you need to leverage the, the, the unique specificity of a, of a capture antibody? That's a good example of it right there. That's uh, when, when LCMS is needed, you know, you really need to use an, an antibody in the way that it's, you know, the, the, in the way that it's used in a ligand binding assay. So, so yeah. I think that's a, that's a really good um, uh, space for, for, for hybrid uh, um, IALCMS. Um, other, you know, other areas where we've, um, really found this helpful and and i mean lcms maybe over over lba is for very complex um therapeutics maybe multi-specifics maybe these you know the pro bodies where you've got a, a masking peptide that that covers the cdr and it's cleaved in the tumor microenvironment and you need mul you, multiple bits of information from the measurement right so multiple readouts on the same on the same molecule maybe um maybe a, a signature peptide from each of the different business ends yeah. of the of, of the molecule so uh, another area i think that this is pretty powerful yeah so we we actually have a project like that right now in house where we're measuring like three or four different pieces of it right we're measuring the the masking we're measuring the fc or the antibody kind of holistically and then we're measuring let's say a conjugate right a, a drug conjugate on top of that so it's it's an adc plus right so it, i think adc's is is one of the huge areas that we're spending a, a lot more time in um, in hybrid. People, you know, in the past had, let's say, used LBA for total and ADC and used LCMS for free. And mm -hmm. now they're, you know, Genentech's been doing it for years where they do everything by LCMS. Yeah. And I think more and more people are realizing, um, oh, well, it's just as cheap and fast. And, and now you have these extra things that the, 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 the modalities or the moieties are becoming more complicated 
and having that mass spec lets you, you know, I usually say like dial in, right? You can, you kind of pick whatever you want as your detector antibody, right? So instead of um, needing an antibody, you just pick whatever mass or peptide you want and you can multiplex that, right? And have multiple things being detected at the same time. So we're, we're finding that um, a big area where hybrid is, is coming up and maybe, you know, ADCs or even, like I said, AC pluses, let's call it that, are, are becoming, um, it seems like, a, you know, five or 10 years ago, they were pretty popular. And then I felt like they kind of slowed down a little bit. But now I think they're picking back up and you're even seeing, you know, antibody RNA conjugates, right? There's a big oligo field now and you're starting to see RDCs, if you want to call it that, or, or um, ADRs, or I don't know what you want to call them, right? But they're, they're some type of um, oligo conjugated to that. So I think as these molecules become more complex, um, maybe that's another area where we can see the novelty of LCMS pop back up and, and be back in the mainstream of something we should be talking about. I absolutely agree. Yep. Yeah. So kind of related to ADC is one of the interesting applications we recently did, which again is something um, I, I want to eventually get a poster or some stuff because I think it was taking a, the generic MAB approach, right? So for years, you could do a generic MAB by doing, let's say, a preclinical, any kind of preclinical species. Um, you know, you do an anti-human IP, you grab the thing, you digest it, you measure an FC peptide, you know what all those are. And you can get a very quick and easy assay um, within like a one day, two day method development. And then you'll be running samples that same week. Uh, <clears throat> we took that concept and extended it to some antibody drug conjugates where we had a client that um, wanted to screen like 20 or more ADCs to understand stability. And, and essentially they were... Um, different types of linkers and, and different DARs and maybe different sites of conjugation, um, but they all had the same payload. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the payload, there was an antibody to the payload. So what we did is kind of took that generic approach instead of, you know, normally we might spend 10 or 20 days developing a, you know, series of assays for ADCs on unique, um, you know, approaches, but this, we, we took the anti payload, we did a capture and then we just detected an FC peptide. So again, really no method development and it worked for all 20 ADCs with, you know, I think we did all 20 ADCs within like six or seven days or 10 days or something. So it's like a half a day per ADC. Um, and we could look at stability and now we're, they took the best ones that were the most stable with different DARs, dropped them into um, a PK study in mouse or whatever, and then we can support the PK study. So I think, again, that's an area as the ADC field heats up again, um, maybe we can re-stimulate the interest in hybrid. Which, yeah. which is a nice, oh, sorry, no, no, go, go ahead, John. I was going to say, which is a nice segue because to say, what do you see as needed for hybrid LCMS to evolve being seen as beyond a, a niche technology um, for large molecules? Yeah, I think it's, I think, you know, I think it was seen as a niche because people didn't know enough about it or it was used only in the cases where LBA failed, right? Mm -hmm. And I think. Um, we, we probably need to do, we being the people in the field, you know, Barry, myself, all the others that are in this field, probably need to do a, a better job and, and try to bring this up again as a, as a mainstream topic at various conferences. So it was nice to hear, Barry, you guys are doing a talk at WRIB, um, because the more people that talk about this, the more people understand its power. And I think showing examples like generic ADCs or generic MABs or you are the unique ones, right? Where you have the pro body and you want to measure several different things. I think I really still feel like getting people to understand what it can do and that it's not super expensive and it takes long or it's more or worse or harder. Um, I think it will bubble up to be, you know, maybe the, the primary 
kind of technology people want to follow. Yeah, and and if we can do that in, in a way that um, you know is inclusive of of non mass spectrometrist <laughs> specialists, right? And 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 really be able to to highlight the what this what this platform can do for for say ligand binding assay, you know, amino assay scientists, right? So that they can understand where 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 maybe they need to to, to leverage this tool. Yeah, Don, what's your thought on that in terms of how we collaborate with LBA scientists to, and I know, because when we talk about, I know I've done it, we talk about the potential of LCMS or hybrid LCMS and what and, and dealing with large molecules and people instinctively get defensive. I remember I years ago I went to, I visited um, a pharmaceutical company in in. Denmark, who shall remain nameless, um, we um, I presented some of Barry's data, um, uh, which was uh, basically anal- analysis of the um, insulin analogs um, at very at low detection levels, and um, they re- they 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 were not interested. They totally shut me down. Um, be, and it was at levels that you know were comparable to LBA, and they were they totally shut me down. And it was like, well, we've got a we've got a group who can make very specific antibodies. We don't want to talk any further, which was absolutely fine. But I, it's not an uncommon reaction when you talk about here's what LCMS can do for you. It's like, but I've got this, and what, what's your perspective on it? Are you asking Dominic? I asked Dominic. Sorry. Yeah, because yeah. I'm thinking that's what I was going to just say is since Dominic was traditionally an well, you guys LBA are just guy, having so much fun without me. This is the <laughs> I just figured it, just figured it wasn't it intentional. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. What's the what was the question? Sorry, I, it was, um, I guess the question generally is what's your perspective since you're you know representing let's say the LBA side of the world um, on on hybrid and, and its utility. Cause I, I feel like in the last, you know, years we worked together, I think you really see the power of it. So yeah. Maybe- so it's funny. I was going to jump in earlier and talk about how you guys like to literally light things on fire and then char it and then spray it against something and take okay. a look at it. And I, I often said, Don, when we first met, why the heck would you do all that to a protein? Why are you beating it up so bad, right? I don't. You remember those days? Right? I'm like, what the heck is this? Yeah. So I was. I mean, if you if you had asked me five years ago, I would have said, "Oh, this this is this is nuts." Unless you're trying to look for, like you said, some sort of one amino acid change. Of course, that's obvious, right? Or maybe yeah. but you're. I, I've come around, haven't I, Don? Right? Yes, you have. Yeah, and and it doesn't mean I think it'll <clears throat> be able to to replace ligand binding assays. We don't think that's the but it has a lot of utility for um in addition to the obvious things looking at um endogenous versus wild types and uh, sorry just redundant there looking at an endogenous versus a recombinant or um some tricky biomarkers anything that's promiscuous right where one antibody uh can potentially not be that great it has massive um upside versus the ligand binding assay trying to get two antibodies on there I frequently talk about that. I think of it as like a piece of real estate on the protein that, again, might not have some specificity or if it is challenging, doesn't have high affinity, high avidity. Even if we can get something dirty pulled down, that allows you to work. And then so that that's that is all for PK and biomarker work. But where I've really come around, Don, is on the ADA, right? That's the component of things I see a nice future for. Now, again, I don't think it, you don't have to take a mallet to a thumbtack here, meaning if you can do a traditional ligand binding assay to date, it's still probably a little bit easier, or at least has some more rigid, um, clear defined guidelines around tier one, two, and three. However, if you need to isotype or, you know, all of that has massive upside. So I hope that answered your question. Don, right? that, that's the upside. Yeah, and what's your, you know, be interesting because we were just talking about kind of generic. Yeah. What's your, you know, your recent, um, I guess, perspective based on some of the data we've been doing with the generic hybrid? It's, it's more robust, right? So for PK, that's what you mean there. Uh, we call yeah. them universal assays. These would be specifics to MABs and ADCs. Um, we 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 need uh, they they can be done by those LBA methods, but frequently 
um, they need some optimization, they need a little bit more tweaking, we might have to go look at a different detector or capture. And, and I'm talking about all within five antibodies that are reportedly made all the same way. Now, that's not always the case, but it just seems like it's been more seamless to do it by hybrid mass spec because I've got to take one shot on goal with the capture antibody versus kind of two shots on goal with the capture and detector, right? So it's just, it has had some advantages. Um, I'm sure Dr. Sheck Kane, our senior director or our executive director of Biopharma might disagree with me, Don, but I think the whole field is warming up to it. Um, we're, I'm, I'm trying to stay agnostic to the type. I just want to see the field advance or all of medicine advance. It doesn't matter what tool we use. It's, I don't think it'll ever replace, you know, MSD, multiplexing, or even become more routine perhaps in the next five years over an MSD method for a traditional map, but you know, maybe it will. So it, but it has become a, I think a more robust platform for generic testing or universal testing. Yeah. I, I think it's an interesting perspective, you know, we kind of go back to how do we get it mainstream? And, and, you know, you made a comment that I've heard um, people, one person in particular say, you know, oh, my goal is to replace all LBA with LCMS. That's not our goal, right? No. And I think the interesting thing, and, and Barry, you can, you know, give your perspective and comment as well, is I would say KCAS, you know, as a company is, um, like you said, kind of agnostic, right? We have the ability to do things multiple ways. And I would say, you know, maybe we're 50-50 right now, right? There's there's the unique ones that absolutely should go one way or the other because either they already exist or it is that one amino acid change or a drug tolerance problem where LCMS is better. But for us who know both pretty well and aren't pushing necessarily one versus the other, although I'm probably a little biased, right? I think we're we're pretty split down the middle, right? But I do think there's those shops that are, traditionally LBA that won't, you know, John had mentioned about being defensive, right? That they won't even consider LCMS. It's like, it's a competition and you got to fight and fail. And, and I think we look at it as a collaboration and how can we help each other? Um, and that, and yeah. And, and the important that. part of that is not, not to use, lose sight of what Dominic said. This is all about getting drugs to market such that if you've got a technology that can, if, if, if you're spinning wheels on, on something, you, you want to apply a technology that might solve that problem quicker and actually help your, your drug development. Yeah. Yeah. So Barry, did you, did you, um, I don't know if you had much access to the LBA side of the fence, but did you see a distribution of what went LBA versus mass spec, or did you really only see mass spec type assays? Yeah, so the um, the LBA and the LCMS was not under the same roof, although there was some close uh, collaboration there, and so it, you know this it was common that would you know I'd, I'd get a call and say, look look this one. Yeah, this one looks like it, it's going to be a candidate for for LCMS. We're having this this sort of difficulty, and then we'd we'd take that on. So it was really it was, it was nice and, and symbiotic. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's what that that is. I think that's the grassroots behind the hybrid approach. But now, um, that that is not the case. It shouldn't just be for challenging and vice versa. There are yeah, like yeah. regulated compounds. I would say move more towards LBA, move away from your platform because mm -hmm. the bike can be so challenging. And we're making advancements in antibody technologies that you can, you know, there's a whole suite of commercially available pegs that work pretty well on a, in an LBA setting. So it's, yeah, I, I think it's just evolving. And um, Don said it well earlier, don't, let's not bias it. We as an organization at KCS, we're, we're going to try and we'll leverage all of our expertise and experience to guide you the right way, but sometimes it just makes sense to, to do yeah. both, right? Like yeah. if I'm a, and if I'm a regulator, I want you to do both early and often in order to make some, uh, you know, foundational assessments that say, hey, we're, we got to this point by following A, B, C, and D and not just trying to work backwards. So I, I think a yeah. lot of groups, they, they jump on the platform they have and that could cost them a lot of time and money. Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a good point, actually, Dominic. I don't know, Barry, if you ever did this. Obviously, we've been separate sites. It's a, a little bit more difficult, but sometimes we will, you know, go. A, a, if if a customer comes to us, we'll actually go at it with both technologies in terms of feasibility. Yeah, and in, and depending on the readout of the feasibility, that will then say here's the platform we recommend for the long term and go in that direction. 
yeah, that, that's ideal if you can, yeah, if you can, if you can do that. Yeah, Battle of the Bands. Yeah. Yeah, and it sounds it sounds pricey to people, and it sounds yeah. exhausting. But the reality is, right, Barry, if you do that earlier, I mean, the amount of information you get from that, I can tell you, it's a small investment. We, sure. Those sure. that have decided to do it, it's been, you, it, it's, I mean, this is a puzzle, right? And um, we're basically sometimes we don't even know how many pieces they are. <laughs> we don't know what the box looks like even. And yep. so when you start to fill in data bits with just feasibility studies, this isn't us trying to sell you anything. This is us trying to solve the problem. Right. Yep. Yeah. So it looks like we're running long on time. So is it, is it, do you want to just Dawn, Bar Barry, Dawn, wrap up on the thoughts on the future of hybrid LCMS where we go from here? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it we just kind of covered really is, sure. is yep. I think there's, you know, what I'd like to see is us get it out there in the mainstream, talk about it a little bit more, show, you know, its utility so that everybody can be having these proper conversations, you know, that say, what's the best way to solve this problem the most efficiently? Um, and it's not rocket science and it's not always the hard stuff, you know, although, yes, we understand the technology lends itself, you know, to those. And we obviously should drive those, especially with all these new um, complex, you know, multi-dimensional kind of modalities that are coming out. So I would say it's kind of two things, right? One is, you know, show its power in the unique, challenging things that it's best for, and then show, you know, socialize it again, repopularize re it popularize it, um, you know, for what it can do and when it should be used and, and hope it, you know, everybody sees the value of it. Yeah, yeah I'd agree with that, certainly in near term. And, and I, you know, if I could talk kind of more <laughs> pipe dream, I, I think one of the one of the limiting aspects of of this hybrid approach is the is the LC. So if there if there was a way that we could change that by somehow getting rid of LC, that would be that would be a big deal. Right? And um, if you if you read the Hendrik Neubert was the lead author of the paper in Clinical Chemistry 2020 on hybrid approaches to protein biomarkers, we were careful not to say IA dash LCMS, but IAMS, just, in, you know, because there have been reports of, um, of using uh, an immuno capture in tandem, say, with, with MALDI mass spectrometry, where um, some researchers have, have spotted directly from a MISA tip onto a MALDI slide and then, and then looked at the intact mass, you know, right, and for, for, for quantitation. I, you know, maybe that's, Maybe we're well, that's how it starts, it. though. No, Barry, no. talking about it, that pipe dream you talk about is how we wound up on the moon, right? So yeah. that is what needs to be discussed. Yeah, and you combine that with a, with a protein level internal standard. You you can have, you can have a linear response. It's basically a mass spec amino assay. It's an amino assay with a with a linear mass spec detector on the back end, right? And and if you do, you get around some of the problems with the bottom up protein uh, quantitation, and, and and if you can get a linear uh, a linear detector and and a, a measurement that's very fast and and doesn't require a lot of sample you could conceivably do standard addition for every sample mm. right and and you talked earlier about the uh, uh the issues with uh, the availability of, of matrix especially for you know non, non-human primate uh, imagine just measuring samples outside of a batch mode without uh, without external calibrators and not a need for uh, external yeah. matrix. Now, now you're talking heresy for G. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hear you, and I guess I, I like the idea of, of simplifying and making it faster. I think <clears throat> I struggle with the sensitivity, right? Yeah. So a lot of times that chromatography yeah. drives the sensitivity, as we talked about micro and nano and Absolutely. Um, and even intact, right, would be, it's always driven by sensitivity. So, Absolutely. you know, maybe you start with the, let's call it the easier low-hanging fruit to prove the concept, right, that you don't need the super sensitivity, but you can show the quickness and the speed and the lack of LC needing right. and all that. It, it may never be good for the, uh, you know, for, for anything but the low-hanging fruit, right, because I think you're going to be limited by sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah. So who, who, whose group was that out of, Barry? I can... Um, the uh, the first author was Trenchevska. It was uh, Brad Agerman put together a special uh, focus oh, okay. issue on hybrid okay. uh, uh, yep. assays in two thousand sixteen in bioanalysis. I can send you the, the link. Okay, so we're we're this has been a 
wonderful discussion where one of our longer podcasts in recent memory, we're going to try to wrap up. Where does this work in the cell and gene therapy space that I see somewhere in here? It has to have some application hybrid uh, potentially could. Um, I like where you were going with the Maldi. I'm thinking, does it, yeah. is there a high res mass spec version? But maybe that's all just another podcast because we have to get to the really important things, Barry. I hope someone prepped you for the hot seat, right? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's get the thoughts on the cell and gene therapy at least quickly, Barry. I would I would appreciate your perspective there, and then we can so, we can wrap up. Yeah, I think we, we know that it's that it's useful for um, transgene protein um, analysis, quantitation, right? I, I yeah, don't know well, if I can say more than that. Yeah, but the LBA can do that too, right? So I, I don't know, you know, right? It's in the same spot as what we just talked about, but I think more around. You know, is there a, how, I know how much you know about biodistribution studies and viral vector measurements and all that stuff? It might be not needed in this space, but that's where I was going. Really, there is some high demand right now. They have to, you know, we got to kind of look at like maybe 20 tissues at a time. And there's a lot of controversy about how we do that in a non-clinical space. There is some interesting imaging that could solve some of this, mm -hmm. but I still think I wonder if there's a way to. Again, I, I don't know if it's just way too sensitive or needed, but I, as I don't even know if anyone's looked at a viral vector on there, but that, that pops into my head in terms of like, what, what, what do I need, right? Um, or even like, no one's put lysed cells on these, right? Is that, or, or maybe you do, uh, I don't know. I mean, it'd be interesting. I know, I know, you know, Habibi is very interested in Maldi imaging. So, you know, it might be a nice topic okay. for a future um, podcast to kind of talk about how that could be pulled a little bit more mainstream for the whole cell and gene therapy kind of field. Okay, well, <clears throat> we're gonna rub up right up. against it. We still got yeah. some thing. We got really important stuff. So, uh, Barry, um, I don't know if anyone's prepped you, but I hope they have. Why don't just let's start with what's your favorite drink? <laughs> Favorite adult drink, as, as, yes. I, as I understand. Yes. Right? <laughs> hey, John, John, you want to try it? Oh, I know. I no, you go ahead. Right. I'll, I'll go with um, Landlord Cask Ale. Oh, jeez. Okay. Um, if that's a beer. You said a cask ale? Yes. 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 So if ever you want to get in Barry's good books, take him on a trip to the UK, and then he's in, he's a happy camper. <laughs> is that is that like is, it's served at room temperature cask beer is typically, right? Yeah, just below. Okay. Yeah. Oh well, I'm and you say landlords. Is that out of uh? I'm up at this. T Tim Timothy Taylor, I think, is the brewery. Mm. Uh, which I think it'd probably be Yorkshire. Okay. Yeah. Well, you caught me off guard with cask beer. I don't. I, 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 I probably I, tried ten and maybe liked one. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I have to lean on on John for the for the details. Uh, well, he can. We're gonna have to shelve them because we have another important question for right. you. Because we yeah. cannot go a podcast without talking about food. Okay. In particular, things like pizza, my big green egg, or my uni pizza oven, right? So, Barry, what about your favorite dish to make? To, to make it is um, halupki, and I actually made it this this week, you know, um, stuffed cabbage. I usually usually like to use, uh, you know, cabbage fresh from, from my garden, but obviously not available now. But, uh, yeah, I made some this week, and uh, it's delicious. Yeah, tell it. Well, th this is a good one. Now, uh, now you're speaking my language a little more. Stuffed. What do you stuff it with? <laughs> uh, it's a beef and onions and and, and okay, rice. Nice. The beef is yeah. We have a local farm uh, store here, so grass fed, uh, locally raised, organic uh, ground beef is delicious. And I hope I don't sound like I'm insulting anybody, but that seems like peasant food, basic stuff, but delicious, right? Like yes. ratatouille esque. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you start, you start with good quality meat. That's a that's a good foundation to build anything <laughs> from. You know, it's. <laughs> I'm a, I, 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 I've just got my monthly shipment from our local farm where the, they have got a CSA. So now I have a freezer full of meat. That I'm trying to figure out what the, what the hell to do with it, you know. And they had additional the additional cuts available, and I bought more than I actually had room in the freezer for. So yeah, it's <laughs> and we're we're we're, we're kind of going a little bit long, but we always do like to talk a little bit. Barry, tell us maybe we sometimes John and I say, what's your weekend plan but plans. maybe just tell us something interesting or a, a vacation you might have in the next month or two something something cool coming up in your life that you want to share well sure actually it, you know it ties into my weekend plans i'm getting ready to uh to travel to uh, san diego for an on-site um on-site week uh with uh, my my co-workers at uh, Crenetics. some of them i've, I've just uh, this would be the first time i've met some of them oh so wow looking forward to that 
Yeah. And that's always, I mean, what a fabulous place. Probably right. yeah. my favorite place in the world <laughs> outside of my home is, is uh, San Diego. It's yeah. certainly up there. Yeah. 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 Can't, can't beat that. So um, with that, I think it's a wrap. We're going to, uh, well, maybe I'll say my parting thoughts. This has been a, a fabulous uh, podcast. I appreciate you taking the time out to visit with us, Barry, uh, and Don as well. What a fascinating one. Don, I hope your feelings aren't hurt. We'll get more about your favorite stuff at a future podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been it's been a pleasure and an honor, and I hope our audience has enjoyed this because this is one of the um, – I feel like it's a big advancement in medicine that's been around for – Don would say, gee, I've been – both of you have been saying, well, I've been doing it for 20 years, but, you know, you, you kind of made it, right? It is making its way into every conference. It is becoming a more routine thing. Um, five years ago when I asked people about it, maybe one in ten knew what it was. Now we're up to, you know – Seven out of ten, not quite. 10 out of 10. But maybe some party thoughts, and then we'll uh, thank no, you. I would just just quickly say thanks very much, Barry, for joining us. Uh, and certainly, I, I I've been wanting to do something like this for a long time because we know that we have Don's expertise, but it's always good to have another expert to talk about hybrid LCMS and and, and where it where it can pos where it can help. Um, like I say, I'm a great believer in the approach, and it, it it's it's always good to have a discussion on it. Yeah, th thanks, John. Th thanks to you and, and Dominic for the invitation. Uh, thanks, Don, for, for a great conversation. It's always a pleasure to, to talk. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's fun. We love to and I, I suppose that we, we can resume at WRIB in June and, and talk more about it there. For right some of our favorite drinks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm going to struggle to get some landlord in for that. <laughs> although, although, though my wife is going back to the UK and for her first trip, since before COVID, so maybe I can get her to smuggle a couple of bottles back. <laughs> on, on that topic, though, I've, I stumbled across, I went. I just went to a local uh, beer store a couple of weeks ago because I was looking for some Indian beer to have with a curry and stumbled across Western Cider, which is like, um, the Stouffer Press is made by Westons in Herefordshire, which is a, a must-have every time I'm back in the UK. <laughs> so I was a happy camper after that. On that note, I shall probably say it's time to wrap up and thank you very much for everyone for, for joining us today. Thanks again. <laughs>